This conference will now be recorded. Okay, so the conference is recorded and we will provide the recording to you after the session is over. Uh, let me go back to the beginning and uh, uh, start my presentation here. So hopefully everybody can see my screen. If you can't, you can put it on chat uh, that you're having any kind of issues. And at the end of the session, like I said, we will have a recording and we will provide you with the slides. So the goal of today's uh, session is to again review the steps of processing RNA-seq data. Uh, last time, as you remember, we talked about pre-processing, so we talked about adapter trimming and PCR duplicates. We talked about alignments, uh, different methods of alignment, and we used specifically bow tie to T, alignment to transcriptome. Uh, we talked about quantification, how do we get the table of expression and what is in the table of expression. And we will talk today a little bit about normalization, and then we will switch over to differential gene expression. So we'll actually talk about students' t-test, p-value, false discovery rate, fold change, and we will look at some methods of differential gene expression like EDGAR and DSEC2. Uh, Faizan, you have a question you want to ask now? Uh, okay, sir, I have a question about uh, RNA-seq. Uh, that you were talking about that there is a doctor and PCR duplicate. So uh, last time there were uh, pairs or the sets we used in the pipeline. So I want to ask that the pairs or the nucleotide you use that were RNA-seq, uh, I mean transcriptomics, or that was the or original DNA sequences. Yeah, so uh, good question. Obviously, this is RNA sequencing. Uh, transcriptomics talks about transcription. So we are dealing with transcriptomic data, which is gene expression. So what is uh, the mean, difference between... Mean we are dealing with the mRNA. mRNA, exactly. So uh, as you remember, there is the DNA. Um, the DNA is then uh, transcribed into mRNA. And what we yes. measure in RNA-seq is expression of those, so counts of mRNA. Um, okay. okay, so um, this is a good uh, question. So let me quickly pull up something um, to explain briefly. Uh, this is from another, um, another uh, may maybe this is good to just give a quick review to everyone. Um, what exactly are we talking about? So, as we, uh, as you remember, in the last pipeline that we prepared, we used FASTQ files. And so this is an example of a FASTQ file. It has a record of a short read. Uh, so you can see the length is 36. Today they go uh, between 80 and 200. Uh, but these are short reads of sequences. Um, and these are sequences of uh, the genome, transcriptome, uh, different things. But we specifically focused on RNA. So RNA transcription uh, works like this. You have DNA in the chromosomes, right? And eventually they end up being proteins. So how does it get from chromosomes to proteins? DNA is transcribed into RNA, right? And these are going to be um, just sequences of RNA that later on are transformed into mRNA, messenger RNA. Um, and then RNA is translated into proteins. Now, this is a more detailed view. Um, you can look at the RNA transcription, which is what we are focused on in RNA-seq. Uh, and different events happen during that process. Specifically, when we talk about RNA directly transcribed from RNA, from DNA, it has everything that the DNA has just in a different format. But when RNA is transformed into mRNA, there are specific things that happen. Uh, for example, uh, the, um, the exons are spliced out. So we have uh, only exons. Uh, we assume that these are primarily exons in our mRNA. Um, and so we are actually looking at 
uh, only exons and maybe sometimes different combinations of exons that make different transcripts. So when we talk about RNA transcription, we're really talking about RNA transcripts uh, and not necessarily, they are not necessarily always exactly genes, okay? Uh, now, another aspect here is uh, just to demonstrate that, um, you know, we have, for example, uh, a DNA sequence and that DNA sequence has positions. So uh, all of the positions of genes are recorded in the GTF file. So genes, exons, and introns, all of their positions are recorded in the GTF file. And then we have this reference FASTQ files. And FASTQ files actually is what is being read. GTF is a reference. FASTQ is what is being read. So what is in the FASTQ files? You have these different isoforms that are alternatively combined uh, exons into a sequence, and, and that is the mRNA sequence. And what are we trying to do? We are trying to count the reads that fall on those sequences, that uh, fall onto those transcripts. Um, and uh, this is just an example of what is inside that GTF file. So we use this reference file uh, to really align everything together. So does that make sense? Faisal? Present, sorry. Yes, sir. Thanks. Okay. Excellent. So let's go back uh, to uh, this presentation. Um, and we will. Yeah, go ahead, Rahul. I had a related question. Yeah. Uh, so when we make the library for sequencing, it's actually the DNA that we are sequencing, right? When we do RNA seq? No, we are sequencing RNA. No, no, no. I mean, when you, so, I mean, the RNA is isolated, sequence. the RNA isolated and made into a DNA, right? Or, or yes, the CDNA. Sequence? Yes, exactly. Yeah, so it is in DNA format, but the reference yeah. material is RNA. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's a good clarification. So in ten, in terms of library prep in the lab, you do use CDNA uh, to because it's more stable. Um, to read, so uh, that that is correct. But the reference material and what we are studying here are mRNAs. Right. Okay. So what is differential gene expression? And I assume a lot of you are already familiar with this, so it might be uh, some refreshment uh, for you. Um, and uh, what we will uh, talk about today is differential gene expression, and then at the end. We want to talk a little bit about annotation and gene set enrichment analysis. So we will uh, talk about or try to understand what does this mean. Now, if you remember in terms of our project, we used a number, so actually 11 samples, uh, right? We used uh, uh, these uh, reference links to files that are already uploaded on the server. And we are looking at this is our metadata for the samples that we're using. So we have the sequence reads, uh, so those are the FASTQ files, and then we have their subtypes. So these are non-malignant or normal-like and versus cloud and low. And this is just a visual example. Uh, since we have names of cell lines that we are actually dealing with, this is what they look like. Uh, so you can see that they are quite different um, even visually, right? Uh, now, uh, we um, let me uh, show you, this is the pipeline. So obviously some of you have not seen the result of your own pipeline. We all have this link in the chat. And here you can always go and see in the uploaded data, th these are the files that we used. So you can see that they are paired in. So we have underscore one and two. Um, Sahil, what was the question? Uh, no, nothing. I was just talking to Abir. Uh, I guess there was a connection issue, so I'm just talking to him. Sorry, I replied to everyone. Uh, okay. All right, so yeah, so these are uh, parent files, and uh, in the end, you will get 11 files, and this is the reference table that we were looking at. Okay, so... Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, does somebody have a question? Uh, yes, uh, from my side. Uh, sir, you are talking about that uh, the uploaded file are in the pairs form. Uh, last uh, in last way we were uh, dealing with the pipeline. So we are dealing with mRNA, but mRNA is a single uh, or single nucleotide long chain. So how we can make it in pairing? I mean mRNA is always in a single. So how we can make it pairs? Right. So okay, what what is meant here by pair end? is that actually the reading of each fragment happens from both sides, right? So you have a single strand of RNA that has the beginning and the end, the three and the five, fine. And the reading of each read happens from both sides. So you don't have two-stranded DNA and you read two strands separately. You are reading the, the same strand read uh, from both sides, and that is the paired end. Does that make sense? Okay, sir. Thank you. And that is used to make it more reliable because there are sequencing errors and because you want to make sure that you are reliably reading the actual sequence. Thank you. Okay, so th these are paired end reads, um, and this is the simple pipeline that we did. We took, uh, uploaded the files, uh, transformed them. Uh, into paired end, so combine them together. And then we referenced uh, the transcripts, the known transcripts, and we prepared an expression table at the end. And what we want to look at is what is inside the results. So if you open this folder, now all of you have the link uh, to the pipeline. I'll just paste it again in the chat. And you can go ahead and open this pipeline and take a look at what is inside. So what do we see inside? We have a number of tables for genes and a number of tables for isoforms, as well as a mapping statistics table that gives us the quality of mapping of those reads, uh, how many of the reads were actually mapped, how many of the reads were not mapped. And if you remember last time, we did talk about this a little bit. So today what we wanna do is we want to download this expression genes FPKM and take a look at this table. So if you uh, download this uh, TXT file, this is actually a TXT file with tab delimited um, uh, columns. And we already looked at this table before, uh, but just to review that again, we have the gene name and then we have column names which correlate with the samples, okay? So um, quickly, so that we can arrange this in the right way, we can now maybe annotate this table so that we know what we are looking at. Okay, so let's open this up so we can see the full name. And uh, we can go back and look, what are these samples? So what are these samples? 687, if we look at 687, this is normal-like, 688 is normal-like, 697 is cloud and low. So what we can do is add another row here and we can write that in. So this is normal or we can just say NL, NL, and this is cloud and low. And let's keep on going. So we have uh, 697, then we have 703. 703 is cloud and low. So this is cloud and low. 714 is uh, cloud and low. 716 is cloud and low. 720 is cloud and uh, is normal like. 721 is normal like uh, 726 is cloud and low 634 is normal like and finally 636 is cloud and low so as you can see uh, they're not really organized so what we did last time was we kind of switched them around so let's just uh, call this group okay and now we can take these 
um, and then we can um, paste them over here and we can take this one and we can paste it over here. So now what we have is all of these are, uh, sorry, all of these are normal like and all of these are cloud and low. Okay, so now we know that we are dealing with two groups. Does anybody know how to measure differences between two groups of samples? Hello. Hello. Yeah, we can use t test and for uh, log full uh, and full change for the measuring differences between two groups. Excellent. Thank you, Pranita. So indeed, what we uh, use as a statistical test to differentiate between uh, these two um, groups is something called students t test. So a little bit of what is exactly students t-test. Back in the 1920s, uh, there was a gentleman whose name was William Seeley Gossett, who invented the students t-test. And the reason he invented this test is because they were studying different barley crops uh, from which beer was produced. And they wanted to know whether there really is a difference in uh, how beer is made from these different crops. And so, so he came up with this statistical test, but he couldn't publish it under his own name. Uh, so he used it, uh, used a, a pseudonym uh, student. And today we know of this test instead of gossip test, we, we know it as the student's t-test. And what it really shows is this formula. So this is obviously a simplified, this is just the concept. And so it's good for us to understand this concept a little bit. The idea is that we really want to measure a signal uh, that is reliable by removing the noise. And what does that mean? That means that we can compare means of groups, and then we can also include the variability of groups so that we know that we are not randomly selecting some value. Because on random, things can also appear to have a difference, but that does not mean that it is a consistent difference. So let, let's take a look at what exactly that means. Let's take a mean of this. So this is a gene, right? And this is its expression level in each sample. And so when I want to just on average look at the expression level within this group, what I need to do is I need to take a mean. So let, let's uh, do this as mean for NL, and this will be our mean for uh, cloud and low, okay? So for NL, we'll just color it as yellow, and this will be our um, same color, orange. So how do we calculate mean? Mean is average. So average of these, uh, sorry, the average of these and what we need to do is we need to put it here so th th what is this number this number is the sum of these numbers divided by the number of these numbers so one two three four five so all of these divided by five and all of these divided by six so we want to do this and then we want to do a mean of these numbers as well Sorry, average of these numbers. So we know that the, on average, this gene is expressed at 7.5, and that on average, the same gene in this group is 10.33. The question is whether this is really bigger than this. The answer is pretty simple, right? Three approximately so so what we can do is we can just measure what is this minus for example this or we can do this divided by this right so those are two ways that we can measure the difference and when we say fold change pranita said fold change 
actually this is fold change uh, because we're looking at how many times how many fold right that's the name fold fold change um, is this one within this one okay does that make sense so far just making sure if anybody has a question about what we're doing so far please ask me Okay, so no questions, that's good. So now we want to understand whether this or this is really a statistically significant difference. What does that mean? Well, what it means is that these numbers have a certain distribution and these numbers have a certain distribution. How can we look at the distribution? The way we look at the distribution is by the following way. So we can insert, for example, um, a simple sorry, uh, bar chart. And we can see that these two are not exactly the same, right? For example, you have really small numbers, you have large numbers, but you have a different number here, a different number here. So on, it, it's hard to say whether the average is a very good way to represent the difference. Because even though there's a small, maybe 1.4 fold change between the two, it might have been uh, you know, misleading to say that this is consistent for every single a representative example from this group and a representative from this group. So to um, overcome this question, we uh, rely on a probability. And the probability is to say that we want to um, see whether we have any sample from this group. Uh, um, significantly different from any sample in this group um, and that it wouldn't happen by chance and the way we calculate that probability is by assuming that maybe I would take random numbers from here and random numbers from here and by chance if these numbers were completely random and these were completely random I could still achieve this full change okay so what we um, fortunately, we have a t-test uh, function here that allows us to create this probability value, also called p-value. So what we can do is we can take these, uh, this array of numbers, and we can take this array of numbers, and then we can do two and three, and this is our p-value. So this is the probability of this difference happening by chance, okay? So if my probability of these two being different from each other by chance is about 38%, do you think this is a good probability that the difference is reliable or a bad probability that this is reliable? What do you think? It's reliable. Right. So the, what do you think this means, uh, Faizan? This uh, actually, when we, talk, uh, when we talk about the p-value in statistics, so we measure the value with one. If the uh, probability is less than one, so we take it reliable. If the difference is exceeded from one in p-value, so we can say that the difference is not reliable. Okay, well, let, let, let's take a look at this example once again. Let's take some random values, okay? So let's take one, Two, twenty-five, three. Okay, so this is just some random numbers I put together. And let's take some completely different numbers. 
So zero, 20, 10, one, one, seven, okay? And let's calculate the mean, so average. and average for these numbers. So are these different? Not, not by a lot, right? Even though the numbers are very different inside. What if I change them to be exactly the same? What would happen? They are exactly the same now, right? So the full change is equal to zero. But the numbers could be a little bit different, right? So for example, the mean could be the same, but the numbers could be completely different and still the mean is the same. Now the question is whether this and this has a probability value of being different. Let's take a look. So if this is my t-test, I'm going to take these numbers and these numbers. So the p-value is indeed one. So it's a good p-value, right? It's a high p-value. Like you were saying, the probability of this happening by chance is an absolute 100%. What does that mean about p-value? It means about p-value that the smaller the p-value, the lower the probability of these numbers being exactly the same or on random appearing as a difference is close to zero. And that is what we're looking for. So when we go back to our real example and we look at 0 0.38, that means that almost 40% chance that this could happen in a random example and we want this number to be as low as possible. A good statistically significant p-value is 0 0.05, which means that about 5% of the time, this could happen by chance, but 95%, we have a confidence of 95% that this will not happen by chance, okay? So that is just something to understand about p-value. So when we talk about differential gene expression, both of these numbers are going to be important, a high fold change and a low p-value. So how do we measure this? Let's take a look and expect this for all of our genes. So we have now the mean for one and the mean for the other. We can calculate the fold change, the difference between these means, and we can uh, test the p-value so we can assume that or we can measure the variance within this group measure the variance within this group and make sure that on a, a completely random example this would not be a significant difference and now we want to actually sort all of these so let's um, create a filter and we want to sort them by first having a high Right, so let's just do a high. Right, what happened here? Let's do this. Let's do a high full change. Okay, so all of these are zeros. And we want this. Um, Uh, um, to be low p-value. Okay. So now, of course, we are also not interested in having those that have uh, a zero full change. So actually, so we don't want this one. Okay, so um, the highest one, let's see. 
All right. Now let let's take a look at this for for a second and see what can we see here. And and this goes back to the idea of normalization, normalizing our values. What you can see here is that some values, so some of these means are very very different. Right. So we get numbers like eleven thousand something. Uh, you know thousands. Um, and the problem with that is that thousand versus two, both could have a significant p value, uh, but they will have a very different weight to their meaning. Um, uh, let's do this for a second. So um, let's do custom sort. So first we will sort by fold change, largest to smallest, and then we will fold by p value. Uh, smallest to largest. Okay, so now we want to go and we actually want to filter out. So we're not interested in fold changes that have a low or a high p value, right? So here we can actually instead do a specific. So here, um, here we want to do maybe less than or equal to 0 0.05 okay and so these are all of the p values all of the genes that are less than 0 0.05 and now we can just scroll down and we see when the fold change goes to I think 1.2 is probably our cutoff. So um, let's find 1.2 is right here. And uh, we can now select all of these genes. So let's go into copy all of these genes and paste them right here. Okay. So what we have now is a list of genes that are differentiated. So how do we know? Let's take a look at an example from the highest one. Again, let's insert a bar chart. And we see what that means. So we see that um, we have low in normal like, right? And high in cloud and low. What about the other way around? Right. So could we have a good p value? But let's go to what, what does it mean when the fold change is zero point something? So let's take a look at this gene for a second. And we can create a bar chart. And this shows us the other situation. So it is again a significant difference but it's in the opposite direction. So when we are actually below uh, zero, we have this other direction. So we're also interested in those examples as well. So let's go to the zeros, right? So actually, let's, let's sort it the other way around. So let's do ascending. And now the question is, okay, what is the lowest value that we want to have? Um, and so if you can look over here, the mean, right? So, so this is zero and the mean is pretty high. Those are pretty good. So zero is going to be good. Um, and uh, we can just take a look at below zero point. Um, so yeah change so 0 0.1 or let's do 0 0.2 so 0 0.2 0 0.2 ends up right here so let's copy that and now we can add them here at the bottom okay and let's do
Okay, so now we have our list of genes that are both upregulated in our um, cloud and low samples and downregulated in the cloud, in the uh, normal like, and the other way around, right? So this is our example for this video. And let's take an example from the other scenario. Okay, so if we take this gene as an example, and we can insert another project. Okay. So we have these two examples. This one and this one. And let's just make sure that we remember what these samples are. Make sure, okay, I just took the extra Okay, so here, sorry. Okay, there we go. So now we have these two examples of these two genes, um, and they are just examples, right? So we have other examples in here, obviously, because we have a total of about, let's see how many we have. So we have about 1,500 genes. Now, this is really the idea of differential gene ex expression. There are going to be a lot of genes that have this pattern of expression, and there are going to be a lot of genes that have this pattern of expression. Now, there is a way to automate what we just did. We did this so that we all understand what we are talking about, what we are trying to achieve. But now we want to create another pipeline that does this for us automatically. Before I move on to that, does anybody have any questions? I, yeah, go ahead, Rahul. Uh, I mean, I had a question about the t test. So when we are comparing these two sort of samples, are we comparing their distributions? Is that the we idea? Are taking, we are taking into consideration their distributions. We are comparing the mean, but we are subtracting the noise. So when we talk about distribution, right? How do we calculate a distribution? A dis distribution means that you take all of the values present, so all of these numbers, and you count how many in each category do you have. So that is called the distribution. Typically, we expect a normal distribution. What is a normal distribution? That means that I have a small number of very high numbers, and a fairly small of very low numbers. And then I have a little bit more of medium range numbers. And that typically looks like a bell curve, right? So if you right. look up a normal distribution, it will look like a bell curve. Now in our example, we are assuming that both of these distributions in terms of their shape is going to be the same but we are expecting the range to be different so the variance within each group to be different and because those ranges are different that that's why we need to have a p-value so we are taking into consideration the range and the range here but we are assuming a normal distribution so that's why we are relying on the mean because mean really um, is just a representative number 
um, it doesn't tell us anything about the distribution. Does that make sense? Yeah, so I mean, when we do a t test or when we get the p value, they tell us that the distributions don't overlap. Or you know, they chance. tell us, no, they tell us that if by chance we had a, a number, uh, you know, a range of numbers, um, and so, so let's say, you know, they went up and down, up and down, up and down, they were just random numbers, and these were up and down, up and down, random numbers. So if we take a mean from here and a mean from here, does that mean that these individual numbers are actually different from these? It's impossible to say, right? So what yeah. we so how do we know? Well, because these go up and down, we organize all of them so that they go from lowest to highest, right? And that gives us a sense of distribution like you said um, and then we compare the length so if we have every number is different that's one scenario if a lot of numbers are similar like here these are kind of similar right yeah that means that the distribution is actually narrow so when a lot of numbers are similar to each other the distribution is narrow and when there is a lot of different ones that means that they are wide and so we are taking that into consideration, but we are still checking whether the difference that we find using the mean is has a probability, a low probability to happen by chance. That's the p-value. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay, so now let's go to the platform and take a look at how we can use this differential expression section right here to calculate this uh, not manually in Excel, but actually algorithmically using methods that also take into consideration false discovery rate. That is another statistical issue that we're not gonna go into very deeply because we only have a short time left. But the idea is that you will have very many genes and uh, because of the number of those genes some of those uh, values could also be found by chance right so if you flip a coin very many times um, if you find a lot of coins that have uh, you know some kind of a strange result like they all fall on heads or they all fall on tails just because you have a lot of times that you flip the coin that means you are falsely assuming that the coin is faulty just because you found let's say 50 out of a million times that the coin flipped all the time on its head right so that's the general idea we're not going to go into it too much but it takes into consideration just the amount of genes the amount of samples that or the amount of genes uh, features that we have in this table so let's uh, create an rna seq pipeline for those of you that um, don't remember the SVL, let me give you the SVL again. Um, so this is our SVL. I am going to place it here in, uh, see, in the chat message. Okay, let, let's take a look at this SVL again what is inside so inside we have the same fast q files so let's go through this again and this will both reinforce our understanding of the pipeline and this time we will do it actually with the pre-processing steps as well and it will include the differential expression okay so now let's convert this to pair end reads fast q files do you remember what we used last time for our reference genome? Yes, that was, uh, that was GRCH38. Exactly, so the latest assembly of the human genome. And now we use this URL bulk upload. So we go here and we find wherever you save. Do you, you remember that you have to actually download uh, the files 
onto your computer to do this. Please, please do this with me so that we all are on the same page. And by next time, I will make sure that all of your pipelines have finished. So I'm going to take this SVL file, define groups. Now we need to take, take a look at our table, right? And we need to place the samples from one group, so normal like, into group A, and uh, cloud and low into group B. So let's drag them. So we have, um, let, let me do this actually. Okay, so um, I'm going to take five, six, or uh, six, eight, seven. Right, so I'm going to take six, eight, seven. Uh, where is it? Six, eight, seven, and that is normal life. Six, eight, eight is also normal life. Seven, two, zero. So seven, two, zero is normal life. 721 is also normal length, and 634. So 634 is normal length. The rest are cloud and low. So I'll just drag them right here. Right? So we have five of these, six of these together, 11 files. We do continue. We do, we're not going to use contrast. So let's just do select all. And now we are going to build our pipeline. So we're going to do trim a matic trim the adapters, right? Then we're going to do PCR clean, remove the randomly PCR amplified reads. Then from here, where do we go next? Can somebody tell me? Uh, we can uh, use top hat for the mapping the reads on a genome, reference genome. How about transcriptome? How do we map on reference okay. transcriptome? Uh, bow tie? Uh, yeah, so which bow tie? There's a bow tie right here, hmm. bow tie right here, and a bow tie right here. Which one do we want to use for mapping on transcripts? The T. The T. T, exactly. So bow tie to T, mapping on transcripts. Thank you, Rahul and Pranita. So we align on known transcripts. This is going to save us a lot of time. And now we need to create an expression table, right? So does anybody remember the difference between these? Yeah, FPKM and TPM, yes. What are they? Do you remember? The fragments per kilobase million, and it's uh, it's how we divide, normalize the data by the length of the gene and and by the total counts of the reads. I think that's how it differs. Exactly, yes. Yeah. So FPKM, we'll leave it here. And now we need to select one of the differential expression modules. So you can choose whichever one you want. Um, cuff diff, the that's not available is because to use cuff diff, you actually use the whole cuff links cuff diff package, uh, which is right here. So you have cuff links, cuff merge, and then cuff diff. But in our example, I can use, for example, DSEC2. Um, you can use edge R, whichever one you want. Uh, and so you can see here, uh, how do we actually use this method? And now reading this, uh, you should probably understand it uh, very well. So a common difficulty in the analysis of next generation sequencing data is the strong variance of log fold change, logarithmic fold change, estimates for genes with low read counts. We demonstrate this issue using the data set. DSEC2 overcomes this issue by shrinking log fold change estimates towards zero. 
in a manner such that shrinkage is stronger when the available information for a gene is low, which may be because counts are low, dispersion is high, or there are a few degrees of freedom. Okay, so degrees of freedom references the number of samples that you have. Uh, gene counts, obviously, you have certain uh, uh, ones that have very small a, n a number of reads that follow them or others have very high. So you take into consideration different variables from the data. So let's, I'm going to use DSEC2. Uh, somebody else could use HR. So I'm going to call Celia RNA seq edge or sorry D set and I can run my pipeline okay uh, is everybody following this so far yes okay excellent now this is actually a good example sometimes as you saw I was taking a long time so I was explaining what was going on and the session closed, so I have this spinning wheel and it's not moving along. And after I see that it's not moving, what I can do is I can actually reload and go to my pipelines. And you will see that the latest pipeline that I created, it is saved. It wasn't lost, but it's only prepared. And so I go back inside and now I can click on run pipeline to actually start my pipeline. So once I click on this, we'll see that the page will reload. And now you can see that it is processing. So I'll go back to my pipelines, and this is processing. Now, what are we expecting as a result of this pipeline? I'm going to try and move along fairly quickly now because we don't have a lot of time. Uh, what we are expecting is a result of differential expression. So here are some files that you can take a look at in your spare time going to paste the link right here. Sorry, paste the link right here. So you can take a look at some of these files. So this is what I did. DSEC2 out. Let's just open this in Excel and see what is inside. So what you uh, can see here are some familiar uh, things, right? So you have log fold change. You have P value, you have P adjusted value, and then uh, base mean and uh, other stuff. So what does this mean? Well, again, we are looking for the low P value and you, you have the P adjusted value. That's where the false discovery rate comes in. So it's P value adjusted by false discovery rate. And that is actually what we're gonna use for a stringent analysis. So what we will do here is we can sort by low p-value, just like we did the other time. So um, let's add the filter, and we will um, sort by, again, we, we don't need those that don't have a non-available p-value, and we need the smallest ones first. So we have a very small p-value, and now what we can do is we can do a custom sort, expand the selection. So we have smallest to largest, and then we need to uh, log to fold or log to fold change, yes, uh, by values. And here we want the largest to smallest. Okay, and here, yeah. okay. So now again, what is less than zero? Uh, or uh, sorry, log fold change right here. So less than zero, what is less than zero? Means that actually uh, this is higher than this. But now you can start seeing that for example, this gene, let's copy it and go back to our expression table and let's try to find it. So here is this gene, let's take a look at its expression values see that is what it looks like
Okay, so this is what it looks like. Um, it looks like I, um, on accident here, got a little extra. Okay, there we go. So that is what it looks like. So again, we are seeing that the cloud in low is lower than the normal light. Now, this gene, you could find it again like we did last time. We can go to just Google, for example, and just look up a single gene. Um, so let's take a look at what this transcript is. One seven two six six. This one. Sorry. Okay. So the common name is PCTK three, and that is the last thing that I would like to show you here, really quickly. Um, let's take a look um, again here, and we can see that we found. Let's see how many we found. So if we take all of these, okay, so we found yeah. sorry, let, let's do this. We actually have to filter out. So we want sorry to be adjusted value. Okay, so let's do um, Okay, the problem is that we do have some yeah, let's, let's go over here. I think we had some MAs here, so it's thinking that it's not a number. So let's just convert this to number. And now we want to sort this or filter them. So we have less than or equal to 0 0.05. Okay, so now we also want to, uh, we want to take this. Okay, let's Place it right here. And let's see how many do we have. So we have approximately a similar number, right? So 1352. Um, and here we have 1522. We are using the adjusted p value that is going to be lower than your regular p value. So actually, that makes a lot of sense. So if we take all of the statistically significant uh, genes, we get about 1300 genes. Um, and now what we want to do is actually understand what these genes are. Now there are two ways of doing that. Um, okay, so um, let's just quickly finish off this presentation. Um, we talked about uh, DSEC2 and EDGE-R, right? So two methods that you could use for differential gene expression. Um, and now we want to talk a little bit about transforming these NSG symbols into um, uh, a name, a standard name, a common name of a gene. And we also want to um, understand their gene, um, so functional annotation. What, what categories do these genes fall into? So I think we're going to have to uh, look deeper into this issue in our next lecture, but today I will just show you how to launch this kind of a pipeline. So if we go into areas of analysis and we go under utilities, now we can upload this output file that I was just showing you 
right? So if we we can take a list of genes, or or we can um, take uh, the result of differential gene expression. So for example, B two. And the first thing that we can do with this, we don't need any groups. We can just use the annotation function right here to convert it into uh, gene symbols and gene ontology uh, categories. So output gene ontology categories. We do have a header, right? The first row of our table is a header. And now it's interested to know what is the number of column with gene transcript IDs, and it is number one. So we can click OK, and, and now I'm going to do um, Elia gene ontology annotation and run this pipeline. So the result of this, I started, and you can also start it on your end, so you will get this in a few minutes because we do have 1500 genes. Let's just take a look at what is the result of um, this kind of annotation. Um, so first of all, this is what this is just an example with 15 genes. So just uh, to see what will be inside of this table. What will be inside is what we used as input ID, right? So you can see that what it does is it takes the ENSG and converts it, first of all, to a gene symbol. So what is this gene symbol? Now, if we take DCN, this is how the gene will uh, typically be referenced in, in a publication. So for example, DCN gene, we know that it's called decorin, right? So right here is decorin. And we can see what it does. So it's a family of proteins, um, and you can see kind of what it does. And what you can also uh, find, for example, are publications um, about these genes. Now we're studying this in the context of breast cancer, so we can just write in BCN breast cancer. And we can, in fact, see that this is a growth factor antagonist for tumor growth inhibition. Um, and it is also has a prognostic value. Um, so uh, progno prognostic value of stromal decorin expression. So in fact, it is um, an interesting gene in the context of breast cancer. Uh, obviously, we have to read through these publications with a measure of, um, you know, uh, kind of evaluation of the quality, but at least we see that it does have reference. And so this is interesting to us. Um, and in the same way, we can go through the other genes, but we can also see here kind of what this uh, gene belongs to in terms of its gene description. So right here you see the corin, BCN, right? And you can see the source. You can see the gene ontology domain. So cellular component, molecular function, biological process, not very informative. But here you also have category description one. So extracellular space, hemidimosome, mitochondrion, etc. cetera. So uh, what, what is the role that it's playing is kind of explained right here and uh, so on. You can now go between these gene ontology categories and start looking at the different descriptions uh, of this gene and try to understand what is the function of this gene and what does it mean when it has a certain level of expression in one group and another level of expression in another group. So this is a short way to summarize how we utilize the results of differential gene expression or any kind of gene expression to understand what these genes do. Now, I think I'm going to pause here because this is we've reached the end of our time. Uh, but I do want to ask you if you have any questions before we leave.
Okay, if there are no questions, um, we will continue next week uh, with gene set enrichment analysis, looking at the results of the pipeline and trying to understand uh, how we can use the genes to map them on gene sets. Uh, gene sets could be pathways or other gene sets that we can come up with. And then we will talk about the interpretation. How do we really make sense of this uh, and how we can demonstrate what we've done? We will also look deeper into normalization. So right now we use non-normalized gene expression values we will take a look at how to normalize gene expression values further between samples and what difference does it make when we use normalization. Thank you again for joining the session and I'm looking forward to uh, talking to you again soon uh, in next week. Uh, Prateem, can I use a gene set of my own for practice in the pipeline? Yes, you can. Um, and Pratima, I'm happy to talk to you further on that.